Boy. I watch the sun rise behind the apartment. After an hour, the security guard wakes up. He spots me waiting opposite the gate and waves at me to go away. Storm clouds are gathering overhead as I stop at the breakfast stool. The man isn't happy to see me. I wait quietly. After he's served two customers, he flips a small pile of burnt scrapings onto a piece of paper and throws it towards me. I feel ashamed. I'm a nuisance. A girl who is sneaking around without permission. I'm not Lola to anyone. I search up and down alleyways, then when my legs are almost too weak to carry on, I head back to the station. Standing near the rickshaws are four girls in bright dresses. Must be the weekend. My heart skips a beat. What if they're from my school? Although it's a long way from their part of town. It's the holidays and this is one of the bus biggest train stations in the city. I walk past as quickly as I can and glance over. One of the girls sees me looking. Don't stare, she says. You might make my dress dirty, her friend giggles. She turns back to talk to them. They're not from my school. Three steps later, they will have completely forgotten that I exist. I pick my way through the rickshaws and crowds to find a corner in the ticket hall where I can watch people come and go. Seeing those girls makes me think about Bella. I wonder what she thinks has happened to me. If I could find my way to her house, perhaps her family would let me stay for a while, but then I would be on the other side of the city. I can't bear to be so far away from where I lost Anna and from our apartment where, dad, where I might find Dad. I think again about telling Bella what's happened to me when it's all over. She will be amazed by my story. About how I couldn't wash my hair and had to wear the same clothes all the time. She'll want to know how much I could fit in my rucksack and how I coped without television for more than a week. Until Dad comes back though, I'm not sure either Bella or I would be able to make any, uh, make any of this seem funny. I look down at my fingernails. The varnish is mostly peeled off. One bottle of nail varnish might cost the same as food for a whole week if you live at the station. A train from some far off city thuds and creaks its way slowly towards the platform. It has lots of carriages and hundreds of passengers. I know because the same train arrived yesterday. Street rats appear like smoke drifting through the ticket hall towards passengers with bags and cases. Like smoke, the passengers wave them away or ignore them. Sometimes they point to bags or taxis and rats scurry to help, their thin arms pulling fat cases. No one says thank you, not that I can see anyway. I need money, but I don't have the strength to lift anything. I rest my head against the wall as a squeal of pain echoes across the shiny floor. It's high pitched, like the voice of a small child. Through the crowd, I see the top half of the guard, his arm above his head, as if ready to strike. I scramble to my feet and run towards the sound. A rat younger than Amit cowers on the floor next to the guard as a girl tugs at his hand, trying to drag him clear. The boy lets out a terrified whimper as the guard brings his baton down again, striking the boy's shoulder with a thump. I feel my legs move and in a few steps I reach the boy and grab his free hand, pulling him from beneath the guard. The baton strikes me instead. The force knocks me to the ground and I feel a shock of pain in the middle of my back. I look up to see the guard raising his baton again, but I'm too fast. I roll to the side, then get to my feet and run towards the platforms. There is no sound of footsteps behind me, but I can't risk going back to the ticket hall. I choose the most crowded platform and keep going, my back throbbing. The sky has begun to darken and I know it's not rain clouds overhead. Night is coming again. I move silently past the last of the passengers towards the sidings. As I jump down onto the gravel, pain explodes again in the middle of my back. I wait for it to pass, then walk towards the old train carriages, past the rusting, uh, rusting overgrown compartments, until I come to the last one. I get down on my hands and knees and crawl under me, then lie still on the sooty gravel, while my eyes adjust to the darkness. After a few minutes, I can make out the faint greyish glow in the shape of a circle. I crawl towards it and then turn around carefully to a seating position. I keep still for a few more seconds, listening for sound from inside the carriage. I hear only car horns honking in the distance. I poke my head through the hole and look around the space. The pile of sheets is still in the corner, otherwise it's empty. I haul the rest of my body up through the hole and sit down in the same corner as before, trying to find a comfortable way of leaning against the carriage. 
I don't know how long I will have to wait. My back feels hot, and when the sore part touches the wall, I breathe sharply. I wonder though where the little boy and girl will sleep tonight. Some of the kids at my school used to laugh about using rats for target practice. Moving targets are better. So I don't know why I was surprised that none of the passengers told the guard to stop beating a rat, even if the rat was only four or five. I must be dozing when I hear a gentle swishing sound. The sound of a body sliding up through the hole. I freeze. Moonlight slices through the window onto its smooth cheekbones of a boy. It's the same boy, and he is staring at me angrily. I told you not to come back, he says. I can feel my heart thumping near the top of my chest. Where's my rucksack? I answered. This is my carriage, he says. I don't share it with anyone. My mouth is dry. Where's my rucksack? I ask again. I pause. I'm not leaving without it. I don't have your stupid rucksack. Now, out now, he says, walking towards me. I push myself against the side of the carriage, but don't move my eyes away from his. I dig the nails of one hand into the palm of the other. It helps me to feel calmer. I'm not leaving, I whisper. He paces in front of me, then raises his hand towards me quickly. I lift my arm to protect my face, and he slams the, his palm onto the side of the carriage instead. I don't have your rucksack. You can't stay here. This is my place, only mine. I'm not leaving. There's nowhere else to go, I reply. The voice doesn't feel like mine. There are plenty of places if you look. Fine, then show me where and I'll go. It's crazy to speak to him like this, but I have absolutely nothing to lose now. He stops pacing and stares at me again. Then he walks over to the pile of sheets in the opposite corner and sits down, still glaring at me. He reaches for a package which wasn't there before. He peels back the paper and takes out some kind of sandwich. He starts to eat. My stomach twists painfully. For a few minutes, he just bites and chews. When he's finished, he screws up the piece of paper and wipes his hands on the T-shirt. I look at it more closely and realise that it belongs to Amit. Tears spring up and I blink them away. You stole my brother's rucksack and now he is on his own without anything. A sob rises up in my chest and I can't stop it. He looks up surprised that I'm crying. You shouldn't have been so stupid as to sleep out in the open like that with a big rucksack full of stuff. So you did take it. He doesn't say anything for a few seconds. First you said it was your rucksack. Now you say it was your brother's. Maybe you stole it from someone too. He's only eight, I say. You should feel ashamed of yourself. It's not about age. It's about common sense. There are plenty of kids here who are four. Even they would have had some common sense to hide a rucksack if they had one. Four, I say. He stares at me. I stop digging my nails into my palm. He yawns. I want to go to sleep, he says. You're stopping me. If you let me stay, then I will get some food for both of us tomorrow. As soon as the words have left my mouth, I regret saying them. He snorts and I realise that he's laughing. You won't get food, he says. I've been watching you. Tomorrow you'll get nothing. Lots of it. He laughs again at his joke. You can sleep here tonight, but only because I can't be bothered to make you leave. Tomorrow I want you gone. And make sure no one sees you leave in the morning. No one. Understand? Yes, I say meekly. My name is Lola. He doesn't reply. I curl up on the floor. It's hard and I'm cold. But I know that I will sleep tonight. I think of Amit and I hope that he is somewhere safe. I wish with every fibre of my body that he is lying on the other side of the compartment wearing that grey t-shirt instead of the boy who stole it from him.